detail up in the hills getting ready for morning chow. The reason we're here is, well, here's the reason. Master Sergeant Art Monaco, one of those guys that's always getting ideas. So he gets an idea, and here we are 96 miles from nobody. The fellas in our outfit are kind of alike in one way. We're the guys that used to like doing odd jobs around the house. And the Sarge keeps us busy doing about the same thing for the Army, like here. This street was an old motion picture set where that straight shooting cowboy, Donald High Pockets, used to come tearing down and rescue the doll from Beverly Meanface. But comes the war, and the Ordnance Department needed a spot to give their men a pre-overseas movement course. So the Army took over, and Monaco got one of his ideas. What he has in mind is to make the joint look so much like a Nazi hangout that when the men move in on the real thing, it'll be just an encore. Of course, during the invasion, there'll be some characters that'll head right for the local beer parlor. So Monaco has an ugly guy popping up to kill their thirst. Also, we're fixing up a couple of good roadblocks, guarded by a sextet from Heidelberg. And in case you forget where you're supposed to be, there'll be a couple of these rags waving in the breeze. Of course, this isn't the first idea Monaco dreamed up. A couple of years ago, he decided he could build some new and better training aids. That idea really caught on. Now the Sarge is operating this shop at Ordnance Training Center in Santa Anita, with us helping him build the stuff. We're making every kind of gadget here that Monaco or anyone else can think of for visual training. And as a result, ordnance men are learning in 25 to 30 percent less time than before. For some of the parts, we've built big wooden models, like this differential. When they're that big, you can't miss seeing how they work. Here's another of Monaco's ideas at work, the striptease chart. You take it off, and you take it off, and finally you're down to the bare facts. Another gag is to wrap the working parts of something in plexiglass so there'll be no secrets. Or take a carburetor. If you can take it apart like this Joe's doing, it begins to make sense in a hurry. How about the light switch on a Jeep? Here's a model as big as the Jeep, and it explains everything. Of course, other branches besides ordnance have heard about what we're doing here. So the Sarge is dreaming them up, and we're dishing them out. Do the top men know when a GI delivers? Well, the President of the United States, the Commander-in-Chief himself, awarded the Legion of Merit to this soldier who used brains and sweat to help make a smarter army. That's a nice thing to happen to a guy in your outfit, and we all feel that the Sarge deserves it. This is a picture of you, the average American soldier. Nothing unusual, but there are some things you may not know about yourself that are pretty amazing. For example, you are five inches taller and 20 pounds heavier than any knight of King Arthur's round table. You know more about maps and compasses than Christopher Columbus. You are a more accurate shot with your rifle than Daniel Boone himself. With your automatic weapons, you have greater firepower than a whole platoon of Napoleon's finest. And in addition to all this, you know more about making beds than the average American housewife. All in all, you're quite a guy. In fact, you're quite a lot of guys. How far does a bullet travel before it hits a jet? 150 yards? Uh-uh. A little bit further. The bullet starts to travel here, back home in the mines and the mills, when the parts of the unmade bullet begin their journey to the factory. Total distance to the factory, 11,700 miles. Finished bullet shoves off for California. 
3,000 miles more. Across the Pacific to Australia. Add another 6,700 miles. Then, 2,100 miles by air, by truck, by mule, and up to the front on the back of a man. And this is where we came in. Range, 150 yards, plus 23,500 miles. Casualties, not caused by bullets, caused by sickness, avoidable sickness. In the United States Army, one of the great causes of sickness is diarrhea and dysentery. One of the greatest causes of diarrhea and dysentery is the dirty mess kit. Chow! Come and get it! Get it, boy. Fill a rep. saying. As I was saying, dirty mess kits. And you ain't kidding, brother. This is the Far East. A few million square miles of land and water which the Japs wanted for their own. So they started a war. Well, they got this far by 1942. They wanted more, but they didn't get it. By early 1943, on New Guinea and Guadalcanal, they began to learn to goose step in reverse. By early 1944, they had to back up still more. Out of the Solomon, out of most of New Guinea, out of the Ellis Island, out of the Aleutian, out of the Gulf. Sure, those were all outposts a long, long way from Tokyo. But knocking the Jap off them readied our side for our biggest slam in the Pacific War. Here's why. For two years, Jap supplies had been flowing through safe waters on a short hop from Japan to their powerful base at Truk, where they were repumped through a network so tight and short that almost any outpost could rush men and supplies to any other. But with every grudging yard of New Guinea jungle gained, with every Solomon Island under our flag, we were slashing nearer to the heart of that network. Then we took the Gilberts. That gave us land bases to menace the supply lines feeding the marshals. And once we got into those marshals, we'd have a powerful flanking front to the whole network. The first job was getting at those marshal supply lines. to wither up those arteries of supply one by one. They wanted to send those Jap ships carrying oil from the Indies, coal from Indochina, guns from Yokohama down to the bottom, sinking them until each Marshall Island was completely isolated from the rest. And as these pictures taken from wing cameras tell realistically, every time our Army or Navy planes knocked another Jap out of business, we were bleeding him of one more plane he couldn't replace. Yes, we neutralized all right. At first, they sent out their newest planes and first team flyers by the droves to get our carriers. They were like a pack of angry hornets coming out to sting and kill the guys who knocked down their nest. Well, that was just fine with us. We shot them down in round dozens. We didn't lose a carrier. roaring in so close you could touch them almost, and get them with the 50.
Take another look at the same Jap showing off just once too often. This was shot by another camera. For 75 days, every day, we pounded those two long strings of coral atolls called the Marshalls, neutralizing. We pounded Millie and Jalawit and Malayalap and Kwajalein and Eniwetok and Wotch. We pounded every Jap airstrip and every Jap seaplane base and every Jap shop and warehouse and depot in the Marshalls in the smoke. We were now able, for the first time, to give the business to these outposts of inner Japanese defense because at long last we had enough carriers because the Jap air threat to those carriers had been liquidated, and because we had airstrips in the Gilbert, a few hundred miles away, for libs of the 7th Air Force. The Japs had counted on these islands heavily, long before Pearl Harbor, and had fortified them during 20 years as powerful bastions of the Jap Empire itself. After 60 days and 1,700 tons of bombs from the 7th Air Force and Fleet Air Wing Number 2, they had no power left. During the last two weeks, fighter resistance in Akak, which had been fierce at first, fiddled down to helplessness. And the only sound on those islands was the thud of our bombs and the crackle of our 50. We used tactics like we'd use in the Aleutians, bypassing and surprise. Instead of cracking smack into a bloody battle at the nearest key marshals to the south, where the Japs probably expected us, a division of Marines from the Gilberts and a division of soldiers from the Aleutians pulled a quick sneak, an unobserved end run to Kwajalein, center of the already must up Jap supply network. And with the Army and Marines, by the way, was probably the biggest fleet of carriers and battle wagons in the history of the world. Fifty-three solid hours of the most brilliant and terrific pasting any target in the world has ever had to take. The Navy and its air wing and the 7th Air Force plastered that boomerang-shaped string of 80 islands with 15,000 tons of bombs and shells. Each soldier and marine and landing craft sailor waiting to go in knew that there'd been about 10,000 Japs in there. And gun emplacements, airstrips, underground networks, pillboxes, beach trenches. Now there was smoke. And to each man, crouched tensely in his barge, a question mark. Tarawa had been held. But before the Navy amphibious fleet struck, on undefended little islands flanking the key objectives, howitzer sections had stolen ashore and set up. From here, they could clear pathways for the invaders on the main island. That's Roy Island, where the Japs' biggest airstrips and the marshals had been. Beside it is Namor, a big supply center. It was about noon when the tough monkeys of the Navy amphibious forces piloted their fleet loads of the 4th Marines safely into the north beaches of Roy and Namur. Most of these guys of the 4th had never seen battle. It was raining a little. But inland, it was strangely quiet, except for the random ping and crack of bullets from Jap small arms. No cannon, no shells. They hugged the white sand and the torn shell holes. They set up communications. They waited until their ammunition reserves came in behind them. They started straight in then. They covered their advance with mortar fire. On a half mile wide coral island, there's no room for complicated tactics and flanking movements. There's just infighting. Shell hole hopping across flat, empty sand with no cover. Each guy fights his own war against the Japs, hidden out there somewhere in the rubble. Most of the time, though, it was a matter of blowing them apart with bangalores and grenades, once they'd been cornered or driven underground. There they go to their Jap ancestors. The rest of the few still alive were like crazy spiders. They hid under rocks and in their pillboxes and tunnels and holes, killing everything they could kill until they got stepped on. Like that. 
like that. The flag went up on Roy and Namur in 24 hours. As the smoke cleared, the story of the weak resistance cleared too. This twisted, gutted shambles of concrete was the kind of bristling Jap fortress our planes and ships had leveled for the Marines at Roy. This was the citadel at Namur. But down south 50 miles, where the Army's 7th Infantry Division had landed to get Kwajalein Island and its naval base, it hadn't been so quick. Kwaj was a lot bigger. It was harder for naval gunners to level completely, and easier for the Japs to defend in depth. General Collette sent in tanks to help the Attu veterans of the 7th as they shoved inland with 37s and mortars. It was the same kind of dirty business, smoking and burning and blasting them out dead or alive. Only it was tough. Most of the time, the Japs just died. Sometimes they'd go crazy and try making a break for nowhere. Like that. It didn't make a lot of difference what they did. If they couldn't be burned out of their holes and tunnels and pillboxes with flamethrowers or blasted out with cannon, the infantry would bypass and come back later to mop up at their leisure. Only 264 out of 10,000 surrendered. When they did, they came out dazed and shaking. Of course, you can't blame them much for not believing what the loudspeaker was telling them that we'd treat them fairly under the rules of the Geneva Convention. If a guy was nuts enough to believe that Japan was going to take over California and dictate peace terms in the White House, you'd hardly expect him to believe the truth when he heard it, or when he saw it as we fixed up their wounded. One thing, sure, it's a cinch none of that pitiful handful of survivors was a happy Jap. And none of them looked much like invincible supermen either. Not with the stink of their own dead in their noses, and the sight of their American captors around everywhere on their island. You can bet your last nickel they would have looked even worse than this if they could have heard that night's sour broadcast from Tokyo. One cannot hide the fact that the Pacific War situation has become most grave. The enemy's advance into the Marshall means that the United States has entered our territory. The first such event since the beginning of our war to liberate Greater East Asia. We are confronted with a situation where the fate of Imperial Japan will be decided. But it's a little doubtful if any of those sullen, monkey-like human beings were much concerned about the fate of Imperial Japan. More than a couple of them expected the same fate they gave our boys who were captured and slowly tortured to death at Bataan. Instead, they got cigarettes and food and water. Soft? Uh-uh. The record shows who's soft. We just happened to be civilized. That's the difference. The Stars and Stripes were up all over Kwajalein when Admiral Nimitz came ashore on the fifth day to see what the islands looked like. In the debris and dust of the twisted defenses, he listened to play-by-play -play accounts of the 4th Marines and of the 7th Infantry Division, led by Major General Charles H. Corlett. That's him on the left. Well, Admiral Nimitz was proud of what had been done to gain America's newest possession in the Pacific, and he was proud of the way it had been done. As he went back aboard his ship, he said so. I look ahead with confidence in what these men will accomplish. They are welded together into a powerful, amphibious team. There is no question as to what they can do to the Japanese. But in the minds of the fighting men, as they shouldered their packs to go back to their transports, there was only one question. Where next? The battle for Roy in Namur and Kwajalein was over. A battle that had ended with a firm American foothold in Japan's outer empire. Now they were moving again. Once more, part of the huge Pacific team which had been slowly blasting its way westward but always into the rising sun. Japan would feel the might of that vast team at Karamashiro and Truk, Enuatak, the Marianas, the Admiralty Islands. The men of Kwajalein were ready for whatever lay ahead. They were leaving behind them a new American flag flying at the entrance to the lagoon, and 286 comrades dead in the shallow coral sand. The Guard of Honor saluted the soldiers and Marines who fell at Kwajalein. 
But it was a salute to men everywhere. From the hills of Italy to these atolls in the Pacific. Men who had given their lives fighting fascism so others may live theirs as free men.